I want to take you to the Bible in our next part of the story, which I think is going to be very moving for you as it's been for me. Elijah is about to talk to God. And then God explains to him that it's time to let it rain again. And remember, in three and a half years, there's been some really bad gossip, a lot of bad conversations, a, bad, a lot of bad testimonies said. The Bible says that the conversations between each other and against those that are with and without, it was changing now. Three and a half years, you got Ahab telling these people, you know what, this is what God has done, and it's time to worship Baal. Baal is the God of rain. But see, my thing is they've been praying for three and a half years. Why hasn't it rained? But the people were focusing on a God that they could see, not on a God that they knew. And sometimes you have to go back to Scripture. What did God say? How does this time, how does this time, where do I find it? How is it expressed in this word? And I'm going to take you back to many, many years ago in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 20. If you have it, say, I've got it. This is what the Bible says. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Lord Father, help us with this teaching today and allow us to understand that we have to make that decision even today in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to focus very closely on verse 21 and I want you to read it if you can with me one more time. You'll have it there on the screen. So I'm reading out of the NASB version of the Bible. Elijah came near to all the people. You see that? All the people and said, now listen closely to his language. How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, now listen to how he did not say, if the Lord is your God. Listen to what he's saying very closely in the language. If the Lord is God. Because see, the world doesn't have to be under God, but they have to believe that there is a God. Huge difference in how this works. You might not consider yourself under, but you do have to know that he is. He will always be. He's always been. And there is no other. Any other God has died and has not resurrected. Not one of them. Not Buddha. Anybody that you can imagine, any pastor, any evangelist, any priest, any pope, any Muslim, any Hindu, none of them have ever resurrected. But if you go to Jesus' tomb, he is not there. He is not there and he, is, he will never be in there. The Bible says from that last place, the last moment, that part of the hill, I explained this to you, where he left and he told his disciples, hey, I'm going to come back once again and I'm coming for you. And right here in this spot, this X marks the spot, I will be back right here and I will take you and you will be with me forever and ever. Let me tell you, can you imagine reigning with him for 1,000 years with no devil? with no sickness, with no disease, with no virus, no pig virus, and no monkey virus, and no chimpanzee virus, and none of them viruses. We're going to be completely free from all that. No rent. No inflation. No gas prices going up and down. I don't know about you, but I can't stand ground beef being $10 a pound anymore. The thing is that God's people, okay? You have to know, one, that he is God, but then there is another group, God's people. We're not praying the right prayers. Eli, what are you saying? Well, let's go to the Bible. What does the Bible say? One, he says, my people perish for lack of what? Knowledge. But you know that we still perish as well with wisdom. We don't know what to do with what he's given us. 
That means we don't know how to put things into place. Now, I'm not saying anything about calling things into existence. You're not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. That does not work. We don't activate or deactivate God. Please understand. Scripture works one way. Through submission, through surrender, through obedience, and his will. What is his will? See, we forgot to pray a humble prayer. Now we're demanding from God. That's the same thing that's happening in this chapter. So Elijah has to say, well, if he is God, well, then say it. Do it. Act like it. But why do you have two opinions? Why do you have to worship two gods? And I'm going to break this down for you. You're going to understand that these people were doing all kinds of dances and all kinds of things with their physical bodies to try to get both gods to answer. They're on both sides. They were literally on the defense and the offense. They were worshiping the offensive and the defensive. They couldn't make up their mind. It's like sitting at the goal lines and you don't know which team you're going to root for. Or you do it like me, you watch the fourth quarter and hopefully your team is winning. But see, those kind of people don't last in the kingdom. You have to begin and in the middle of the fight, continue. And at the end of the battle, at the end, understand that the victory belongs to those that belong to him. Now let me tell you what it says in scripture. Ahab sent for all the children of Israel. This is interesting. Why? Why is Ahab doing that? Why is Ahab? Why is Ahab getting all the children of Israel? Let me tell you, when you want to call someone out and call their sins out, you don't do it on your knees and pray. You call your friends. You call, you know what? That person is messing up. Have you heard? Have you heard what Eli's done? Eli's done that. So we rally around, and that's exactly what's happening in this case. Listen to what the Bible says. It is hard to know why Ahab did this. Carrying out the instructions of Elijah, perhaps he hoped that the people would be so angry with Elijah for the last three and a half years of drought that this crowd would turn against the prophet. That was the whole idea. Let's turn them, let's turn the people against him. He's finally exposed himself. He's finally out of the cave. He's finally out. But there's a gathering about to happen, like today. There's a gathering at Bridgeway Church. There's a gathering at Church Unlimited. There's a gathering at, 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 at Calvary Chapel right here next door. And at the Bible, Bayshore Bible, there's, there's so many churches on the street. You know which ones they are. Imagine today they're gathering. But the enemy of God is also gathering there. The enemy of the prophet is also gathering there. One of the things that I want you to know that when you hide, you put yourself in a position like Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 through, I believe it's 10 or 11, it says that you have to find a place, a secret place to pray. God had placed Elijah in a place of secrecy to try to do what? Ex uh, to hide him from the enemy? Absolutely not. To strengthen him. Sometimes you have to spend time on your own to strengthen yourself. Bad people, corrupt, good morals sometimes. Sometimes bad people. Give you the wrong advice. So God secluded him. He put him in a cave. But if you remember last week, he put 50 prophets in one and 50 in other. And they were fed by what? Remember what I, what I said? They were being fed only bread and only water. There was not a lot of food in those days. Why? There's no rain. Nothing is growing. Animals are dying. You know that because... Chapter 17 and chapter 18, you begin to see that the animals, they're looking at the animals for food. And the prophet says, no, 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 we, we, we got to look just a little further ahead. We need to go find something to give our animals and our people, but don't kill the animals. You find that in Scripture. So why is it important? These prophets of Baal hated Elijah. They love the favor of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, the favor. How many of you have heard that word before, favor? They wanted them. They, they were worshiping it. They were worshiping Ahab, worshiping Queen Jezebel. 
Now they're against the people of God. They're, they're pushing them to believe. Yeah, guess what? Your God, Yahweh, your God, Jehovah, is not real. Why would he punish you for three and a half years? Why can you not heal of your sickness? Your God is not your God. Look at, look at your son. Look at your daughter. Look at your grandson. Look at your granddaughter. I thought you said that Jesus loves the world, that Jesus loves everybody. I guarantee you, you've thought of that before. I have. Why do good people have to die? And why do bad people still alive? Have you ever said that one? The Bible teaches us that these things are happening, and it's happening to humble, listen to me, Elijah and those that truly follow God. When there's a calamity, there is a testing. When you go through something, there is a testing. The first thing that happens when we get a sickness, right, we get, you know, our stomach's not working with us. You know, we get a stomach virus, right, and we, we kind of can't go anywhere, can't do anything. Do you ever think about, you know what, I must have eaten something, right? That's the first thing we think about. I must have ate those bad beans or that bad lettuce or whatever, you know, whatever you eat. If you eat grass like me, that bad grass. Not only cows eat grass, but Eli does too. You know, it was bad, that bad ranch, you know, for Whataburger. We had that the other day. The thing is that we never think about, is God testing me? Is God testing my faith today? Is God pushing me to love him more and focus on him and fast? Because that might be the only way that we can stop eating for God's sake. And just fast for a moment and say, God, what can I do? You know, how can I better myself? What do I have to do? And listen to what happens in the life of Elijah. They enthusiastically promoted the persecution of any true follower of Yahweh. They started punishing them. They started killing them. But over the last three years, they had been severely humbled by Elijah and the drought sustained by his prayers. By what? His prayers. What's the one thing that we do less? Pray. What's the last thing that we do? Pray. He said that he was able to control the drought with his prayers. Can you imagine? How many of you are praying that it snows this year? I think it might. As crazy as this year has been, no rain, then it, we can't get it to stop raining, right? And then the mosquitoes are the size of Texas. You don't mess with Texas and their mosquitoes. I mean, you can spray it. These guys are just licking it off of you. <laughs> It's not even a big deal to these guys, you know. I want you to hear what Meyer says in his, in his commentary. This is, this, is, this is deep, folks. This is, this, is, this is nuts. Meyer says, see with that malignant glances, his every movement is watched by the priests. To Tigger ever watched it, its victim, no tiger, I'm sorry, ever watch this victim more fiercely, if they may have their way, he will never touch yonder plane again. Listen to that closely. The only way that most believers will turn from their faith or their, they will draw cold in that image is by how much pressure the enemy puts in your life and how less you go to him daily in your prayers, your devotion, and how quickly he can stop you from going to church. Those are the things, the gatherings. If I can get them to stop. What happened in 2020? No more gatherings. You couldn't even get together with your family. Many people passed away. Didn't understand what was going on. So we had to learn to use cameras. Learn to use the internet. The one thing that we told our children not to do. Get away from the internet. Get away from your phones. Now even us addicted to it. We can't get the message even of Jesus out of, out of this building. Because most of you will forget what I say to you because you're not writing it down. Dr. Ed Cole said, if you don't write it down, you will never use it. Listen to what Spurgeon says after Myers says this. This, this is tremendous. That lone man of heroic soul steamed 
the fearful torrent of idolatry. And like a rock in mid-current firmly stood his ground. He alone and single-handed was more than a match for all the priests of the palace and the groves, even as one lion scatters flock of sheep. One man. One man. One man. They were afraid of one man. If you notice, we're not fearful anymore. There's no respect for God. I'm not saying that you should be afraid. Some of you, you should. If you're not born again, you should very, be very afraid. But even now, it's the born again guys. We, we don't fear God anymore. We think that we can motivate you to do something. Thinking that we know enough word to make things happen. And we pray for the sick and they don't get well. That we pray for that young man that's in prison for God to have mercy and let him out. But he's still there and dying in his prison. Instead of being this, being the solution to the problem should have been that when that child was little, when that child was young, that we would grow them in the way that they should go, that we would speak into their lives the way that they should grow. We should be the example of them to grow the right way. And now when they are old, we're trying to fix something that we should have fixed when they were small. Why do you think that it's easier for me when I hire somebody? I'd rather hire somebody that has no experience whatsoever because I can train them the way that I want them to work. But if I have somebody that's got everything, that got so many degrees and so many things, I can't use that. They're too smart. They're smarter than I am because I have no paper. See, our world has made us so different. But one man. He, that guy came out of that cave, and I guarantee you he was ready to go and fight some demons. He was ready to go fight some devils. And he didn't care that it was some of his own people. But by this time, Ahab, Jezebel, they've already done some stuff, and they've punished people to the point that they had died. And some of them had died as well in three and a half years. See, when you don't cultivate your faith, when you don't move it around, when you don't do something, you die. You die. Let, let me see what you do with your vegetables. If you don't do anything, if you don't move it around, if you don't prune them, these things get full of weeds and they're sucked the life out of them by the weeds. We don't know that we are surrounded by weeds. You know why? Because we've all, we all look the same. We all talk the same. We do the same thing all together. Because we value more friendship than God himself. Because the Bible says you will not have friends. He goes, I have come to bring division. I have come to bring a sword. I'm going to have a father against his son and then a son against his father, a mother against her daughter and a daughter against the mother. I'm going to have the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law. So don't, let me tell you, he got all of them. The son-in-law against the father-in-law. What? That's in the Bible? Yes, it is. You want me to tell you where it is? Between Genesis and Revelations. Find it. <laughs> it's not my job to solve your problems. I have a good relationship. Where is Josh? He probably left. This is a hard message for Josh. I have a great relationship with Josh. And I have a, a make-believe, or should I say make-believe, daughter-in-law? Or my son has, you know, a girlfriend. And, you know, I pray that they get married. But, but I'm coaching her and I'm pouring into her life. When she comes to my house on the holidays, she and I are the first ones to get up. When she hears me moving pans, she knows there's bacon and egg coming. You haven't had my chorizo and egg. She's coming. And you know what she does, Amanda? She sits. She don't even wash her teeth. Don't tell her. But she, she just comes straight from the room. And she sits at the bar at my house. And I'm there and I'm doing. She goes, what are you doing? I'm just, just preparing food for you. I go, you got some time? She goes, yeah. She goes, you want to talk? I go, all the time. And she sits with me. And let me tell you how deep this is. It's so deep that you have to understand that her father was a high priest in the Muslim world. Can you handle that? This is a girl with dark, dark hair. She looks like one of them. But guess what? Her heart now belongs to Jesus, so it looks like Jesus now. But she sits at my table because she wants to find out, tell me more about this Messiah. You know how I know? Because she told me one day when she was really young, when she was just dating Isaiah, she says, you know what, do you believe that the true Messiah could come and visit my father at his deathbed and save him from his sin? I go, absolutely. He can do that and he will do that. You know why? Because he loves your father. 
He wants to take care of those that he has handpicked from the beginning of the world. So, so you know, so I'm excited for Thanksgiving. I'm excited for Christmas because she comes by again. Hopefully this time, Listerine. <laughs> Sits at my table. And we're there and we're talking and I'm loving this little girl. She is a beautiful little girl. But let me tell you. I have a hard time with people that don't have a heart like that to search for God because they're comfortable and used to it already. See, that's what I can't get used to. I, I don't know why you don't love Jesus the way I do. I don't know why you can't be so attracted to that like her. She comes straight from her sleeping quarters into my bar and wants to know about Messiah. I don't know. But I can tell you that one man, can you say that? One man. See, Elijah comes out of that cave. How many of you know that Jesus comes out of a cave too? He's been dead for just a couple of days, right? And, and he's done what he's supposed to do. What the Bible says, what the Old Testament said about him coming, right? Because that's what Daniel and Joel and Isaiah, they write about these things. And Jesus comes and says, uh, it's time. It's time to get up on the third day and let's bring some victory in people's lives. And that's why we're here today. So Spurgeon knows what he's talking about. He wrote that with his full heart and knowing that there was going to be a time that you had to choose. Are you going to worship God or you're going to worship Baal? And this is what it says. This was a logical and useful question. In general, the people of Israel were in a spiritually lukewarm condition. Did you hear that? The people of Israel were in a spiritually lukewarm condition. Can I say that today about our United States of America, we are in a spiritually lukewarm condition. How do I know? If what comes out of the Bible offends us, we are in a lukewarm condition. They wanted to give some devotion to both Yahweh and Baal. But the God of Israel was not doing that. He's not going to be one. He's going to be the only one. He says, I am the God of my divided attention or my divided devotion. You're going to have to only worship me. There was no option here. At the time of Moses, he says, those of you that are going to worship that God, that cow, you get to the left. But those of you that will worship Yahweh, you come to the right. And guess what? They were swallowed by the ground. It opened up and it took fathers Wives and children, whatever they were holding on to each other, whatever they had in their, pro, in their possession, it went with them. You might say, oh my God, that's what God does? Yes, he does. He does that. He created us. He can do whatever he wants with us. But then Jesus comes into the picture. He says, you know what, you have free will. My grace is sufficient for you. So what does Paul say? Are we going to continue sinning? Because grace about, because there's plenty of grace, are we going to continue doing those things? Absolutely not, Paul said. Once we're washed, we have to understand how important the washing is. Some of us bathe one time a day, some of us twice, some of us three times. I know people that will bathe up to five to six times because they just cannot handle dirt or sweat. And here in Texas, you will sweat. And your sweat glands will sweat more. And then your sweat will sweat. You should feel how warm it is inside this jacket. Listen to this. How long will you falter? How long will you be of double-minded? How long will you falter? The ancient Hebrew word translated falter means to, listen to this, limb. To limb, to halt, to hop, to dance, or to leap. That's what Dilde says. It is the same word used in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 26, where the prophets of Baal leaped about the altar. It may be that Elijah meant, how long will you dance between two opinions? I can imagine, so Adam Clark writes this. Had a sufficiently different understanding. Literally, he says, how long hop or how long hop ye about upon to both? This is a metaphor taken from birds hopping from one 
ball to another, not knowing on which to settle. Have you seen those birds? They just go everywhere. They just don't settle somewhere. The same image that Clark had about the people in the Bible. You would think knowing truth, right, that you would follow truth. But let me tell you, truth to many people is different. I guarantee you, if I tell you, hey, Elizabeth Bess, what color is this jacket? You would say what color? White? You need to sit in the front row, ma'am. <laughs> Bettis, what color is this jacket? Ten? One color. These engineers, they give you two options, right? <laughs> Ten. Miss Starr, what color is this jacket? Khaki? Man, I got four different colors now. Uh, Allison, what color is it? Forget it. Forget it. Jason, I'll trust. Stone? That's what I did. No, let me tell you. What color is this, man? What? Cream. Six different names now. What happened to just brown? What happened to just brown? You know why? Women. <laughs> Women. Right? The primary colors, you know? No, let's give it. The other day I wore a jacket and it says, it's called mauve. What in the world? I'm telling you. We have so many options. So guess what? Faithfulness, fear, it has different options. It has a different result. See how difficult we make life? It could be white. It could be stone. And my engineer over here gave me two options. But that's how it is. Now let me take you to the Bible. I'm almost done. I'm sure, I'm sure you'd like to be here three hours with me. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I didn't think anybody saw that. Thank you. That's JP's dad. He's watching online today. He's homesick. Listen to this. Listen to what the Bible says. This is powerful. Just these two verses and look how deep we've gotten. Listen to it one more time. Verse 21. Elijah came near to all the people. No one can be excluded from the message of freedom. No one can be excluded. The Bible says that Jesus, Miss Wendy, doesn't the Bible say that Jesus will not come back until every person, every human being, right, has heard of Jesus being the King of kings and Lord of lords. Because he's not here, someone hasn't heard of Jesus. Think about that. Because scripture don't lie, correct? And it will come to pass. So listen to what it says. Every person, all the people needed to be gathered. You would think that it sounds like a setup, but it's not a setup. There's a purpose when you gather. There's a, there's a reason why you get together. Someone in this room is understanding this message and is saying, you know what? That could be me. I could be faltering in two different thoughts. On Sundays, I feel like a Christian. On Mondays, I feel like a Christina. I don't know what the other word is. But, you know, I, it's just how it is. I just don't feel the same, right? When I'm gathered with my brothers and sisters, I feel so strong. But then I go to work tomorrow and I feel like garbage. Think about it. Who's paid the price for your soul? Who's paid for your life if it's not King Jesus? There's so much value in you. And that's what Elijah was trying to remind them, to remind the people God is of so much value to us. How can you falter? How can you be trusting a God that for three and a half years, listen to me, you've been praying for it to rain, but God said it will not rain. So the God, Yahweh, that prayer worked. But the prayers to Baal have not worked. So God's about to let some rain come. And this is, this is powerful, and this will probably be next week. It will be next week for sure. But I want you to see this really quickly before I give you my last thoughts. Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you hesitate? You will hesitate between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him in word. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't answer. 
When someone has nothing to say, can I tell you something? That is an answer. That is an answer. When you don't say nothing, you're saying something. When you don't do something for the innocent children that are getting abducted and sold to slavery and used as sex little children, and you don't do anything, you're saying something. When you don't help your neighbor, when you don't help that person that is not saved, you're saying something by not saying anything. You're not fighting for them. You're not paying attention when you have your basket and you're hearing the, the family before you or the, the family ahead of you and they're, they're struggling. And you know the God of peace and understanding that's kept your marriage together to this point. And you could have just helped. Can I tell you about my friend? When I was a brand new Christian, that's what I would say to people. Because I looked like a really mean guy. I'm sure I still do. But I would go, hey, have you ever, you want to meet my friend? What? Who's your friend? Well, let me tell you. Well, what did he do? Well, he did all this. What's his name? Jesus. His name is Jesus. I spoke Spanish back then. I got saved and I became an American. <laughs> Started speaking more English. My first language was Spanish. My, my parents were from Mexico. But I was born here because America wanted Eli. That's just the way I pump myself up like a cheerleader. That's it. You don't have to agree. I cheer myself up. Remember Bad Company? Oh, no, no, that doesn't go here. Okay, let me finish with this. Please listen to this as we end. There was no objection and no repentance. No one was objecting and no, was, no one was repenting. They lacked the courage to either defend their position or to change it. They were willing to live unexamined lives of low conviction. Doesn't that sound like today? You don't judge me. Only God can judge me. Whew. I would never say that. Because according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for those of you that study the Bible, it says judge yourself before God judges you. Because he will not give second chances that are in that judgment. And can I tell you something? Something that you need to write down is this. As a, Christ, as a Christ child or a child of Christ, you are given unconditional love regardless. But as an enemy of God, you will receive the wrath of God. So not everybody, can I say that again? Not everybody, but those that proclaim Christ as their father, those that proclaim Christ as their savior, are unconditionally loved. You know who those are? The ones that are born again. Born again Christians. Those that have been washed by the blood will receive the unconditional love. But those that are not will receive the wrath of God. That's in the Bible as well.